Um, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be back. Um, and it's particularly nice to be back uh, sitting here with, with Ben and friends uh, to discuss what is absolutely a remarkable book. And now I know what you were doing all those times. You were bunking off from ODI. <laughs> you were pulling out this wonderful, uh, wonderful book. Um, and I think it is... I'm not going to do justice, and I hope between the three of us we can at least scrape the surface, but it, it really is a book I would commend for you to, to read. I, um, when I was um, director of ODI, I always complained that I never had time to read a book from cover to cover. Well, the nice thing about no longer being director of ODI is that I did read it from cover to cover, and I have to say I am both incredibly impressed at the, at the scale of it, of the depth of it, uh, but it also uh, very impressed with the extent to which it really made me think. And so I think that is, it, it alone is the sign that this is a, a fantastic book. It has a very high scribble factor, so I very much commend it to you. It also has 65 pages of endnotes. So if you are a geek in this field and you want to go hunting for sources that you never knew existed, um, this is a fantastic place to start. Uh, it's incredibly well researched. And it has stories from Bali water temples through to... Something I didn't, never heard of, this wonderful creation of Henry Ford, Fordlandia, in uh, the Brazilian rainforest, which is an attempt to transport the ideas of American manufacturing to the Brazilian rainforest. Um, you can guess what happened to that, <laughs> but it was a new story to me, and there's, uh, these, the stories throughout are absolutely terrific. So that's the first thing to say. Now, my notes are actually a masterclass in chaos, <laughs> so if I'm intelligible, that will be uh, an added bonus. I... What I wanted just to, to reflect on, in, in a pretty simple-minded way, really, having um, sort of worked in and around the aid business now for much of my career, I wanted to take a step back and say, OK, you know, does uh, this is fantastic. It's an offering, a different way of looking at things. But, you know, does it really throw all the balls in the air? Does this really, uh, you know, disrupt in a fatal way uh, uh, the kind of business that I've been a part of and at some times despairing of over the last uh, 25 plus years. So I'm going to just make a few points about how I see this stacking up um, very much from the perspective of somebody who's worked on aid. So I suppose if I was to be really simple minded about the sort of core proposition of this fantastic piece of work, and I am being incredibly simple minded now, I would say that the core thesis is that the aid system and it and, and you, yeah, the aid system has spent much of its time over the last five plus decades fighting complexity, uh, playing down uncertainty, uh, trading on a toolkit that has essentially backed it into a corner, uh, which is revealed through sort of fixed mindsets, uh, polarized concepts, and uh, kind of misplaced target tree an unbending target tree. So that actually, rather than grappling co with complexity, much of the, um, the kind of rules of the game around which aid has been delivered for the last number of decades has been almost uh, fighting complexity, finding ways to tame it, finding ways to work around it, perhaps. And anybody who spent time trying uh, to make a log frame work will have gone through the agony of fighting with complexity. And anyone even now who tries to get a theory of change on a page and doesn't want it to look like a plate of spaghetti has also, in to some extent, I think, fought with complexity. Um, and so what complexity theories, I think I'm right in thinking there isn't, a, as it were, a unified theory of complexity, but what the various uh, theories and concepts of, of complexity theory officer offer us is a, is a different way of looking at this and also potentially a different way of operating. And this is based on embracing uncertainty, on uh, challenging dichotomies, if you like. Many of the dichotomies that have made up or define um, uh, the way we think about not just aid, but development, I think, are fundamentally challenged by this. And it, it occurred to me as I read and I noted down you know, challenging dichotomies that 
for a, a, you know us as economists we hold dear like principal versus agent or bottom up versus top down or expert knowledge versus ind indigenous knowledge these are all fundamentally challenged i think by some of the ideas ben that you present here but above all um, it leads us to conclude that we should not be asking uh, how to solve problems in development, but aid should really be about how to evolve solutions to problems in development. And it should all be about a process of constant adaptation, of constant questioning, of approximation and, and learning. Now, all that is, is you know, certainly um, gave me pause for thought. And I think what Ben try, is trying to do in this book is to sort of take those ideas, take that, and then I say my very simple-minded um, discussion of his core thesis, and take these ideas and then help us navigate a sort of sensible path through them. This is not a book for fanatics of any one position, I don't think. This is a book that very carefully tries to navigate a path through what I think is increasingly now a field in aid which is polarizing, polarizing around what I call the salami slicing approach to aid and development, which is you do it in ever smaller bits and you evidence it to death and then what you hope is when you add it all up, you get something that's bigger than the sum of its parts, which is one extreme. Or the other, which is almost a paralyzing kind of degree of complexity and feedback and uh, and some of the some certainly theoretical models you present here, which is almost to the point where I don't even know where we go from there. And I think what you try to do, Ben, is help us navigate a path through all that. You don't dispute the need for rigor. You don't dispute the need for accountability and aid. You don't question the need to be able to set some kind of direction when one is engaging. But you do question, using these ideas around complexity, about how... Um, uh, oper you know, systems in designed to support development have to, be, have to be more evolutionary, more flexible, more adaptive, more aware of context, and so forth. And that's a fantastic contribution, and it really does uh, make for very, very interesting reading. And, I mean, if it's not offering a unified theory. It's not offering an ultimate alternative. There's lots of ideas you might want to pick up, some put down, some run with. But it's fundamentally anti-blueprint and I think that is actually a really important contribution at this at this point in time. I did quickly want to reflect though when I um, worked in the World Bank uh, in the 1990s um, I'd wish I'd had this book actually Ben because at that point I worked um, in various parts of the World Bank but one area I worked in was evaluation and there was this interesting um, phenomena at the time where um, which became known as the disconnect in the World Bank, between um, evidence that was coming out of the project portfolio around the overall uh, performance of World Bank projects on the one hand, which used to run a satisfactory rating of kind of 75, 80%, clearly to be questioned. And then on the other hand, a series of evaluations of country assistance programs funded by the World Bank which showed much less uh, satisfaction in terms of performance. Um, and in a third of cases, they were diametrically opposed to one another. So you could have an, one country, you added up the project evaluations, and you got one result. And you looked at the country assistant evaluation, and you got a completely different <laughs> result. And at that time, there was a lot of hand-wringing trying to explain what was this disconnect all about. You know, how is it you can have uh, a project portfolio that seems to be running such a fantastic performance rate, but you actually, when you looked at the bank's contribution as a whole, across a whole country program, then it was a different story. Now, there are many possible reasons for that, and we looked at them all, and we took it apart, and the rest of it, but what we didn't really think of at the time, and Ben's book, as far I think, provides a uh, huge insight, that is that actually one is looking at the world from through completely different lenses. <laughs> And, and what we didn't have is a good methodology at the country level to embrace, essentially, complex systems. And of course, what projects were doing was largely ignoring complexity. They were creating a little, you know, sort of bubble within all of this complexity, holding lots of things constant, and hey presto, there was this fantastic uh, performance rate. So it did make me think about that. I'm now gonna conclude, um, John, because you don't really want to hear from me, you want to hear more from Ben, I'm sure. 
Few questions, though. Um, I mean, I, di I did feel uh, that, you know, if I was to take this and if I was, you know, uh, Secretary of State and DFID or, you know, Raj Shah and USAID and, I, USAID and I had to make something of this tomorrow about, okay, here's the forward strategy. What, what would I need to be seriously thinking about? And I, I guess I did feel it was a bit of a daunting prospect, really. Um, not least um, the fact that, um, you know, you've said it yourself, actually, not all systems are chaotic, actually. In many cases, in some, in some cases, linear approximations of things are actually pretty good. They kind of give us a rule of thumb, it's okay. The question is, how does one know the difference? How does one know? Uh, and how do organi organizations know? <laughs> um, you know, when it's important to adopt the kind of approaches that are being proposed here, and when it's okay, as it were, to fall back on fairly conventional ways of business, uh, of doing business. And I think that it's quite a daunting prospect to find that point, um, as it is quite a daunting prospect for organizations to operate at the edge of chaos, actually. Um, what does that really look like? And on that, it did occur to me that there's a slight assumption in here, which I know you would be horrified that I'm going to say this, but that all of this is somehow costless, that it's easy for organizations to adapt, that it's possible to move, or, you know, to change strategy mid-course easily and costlessly, that moving across your this notion of the fitness landscape is a free mm -hmm. movement, you know, that somehow flexibility doesn't have a price. Well, having even run ODI for a number of years, I can tell you, trying to basically create an organization that adapts and is flexible is hugely costly. It isn't the least cost option by any means. And I'm just wondering whether there are some challenges there around how do you make this both not only hugely appealing as a, as a, as a modus operandi, but how do you make it pay? Very good. Very sneaky, I think, to have final reflections and then conclusions. Yes, I know. No, um, so no final reflections followed by conclusions. Please uh, concatenate the two. Um, Owen. 